<laughs> you wouldn't know cool if I locked you in the freezer. <laughs> For your information, Mr. Krabs, Squidward has locked me in the freezer, so I think I know what cool is. Stop wearing that nasty thing to work. But, Mr. Krabs... No butts. So I can't have a wig or a butt? No, SpongeBob. It means until you get rid of that wig, get your butt out of here! Kill the intro! <laughs> And welcome aboard to the only podcast that guarantees that there's still no wiggies from Chalk Zone running amok after the 2002 incident. I'm ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. I'm your host, Captain Eric, and it's a pleasure to have you here as we continue our sail through the fourth season of SpongeBob SquarePants. And that slick little Chalk Zone reference is actually a reason for me to bring up the season finale of This Week in Nickelodeon History, dropping this Sunday. March 19th. So that'll be dropping on all conceivable podcasting platforms, or most of them, and YouTube. And this is a big deal because unlike the season one finale, I'm not going to bounce into a new season next week right off of the bat. I'm going to take a little bit of a break in between seasons, refocus the show, and I'm already excited to bring a new template, a new element to the world of podcasting, anniversaries, Nickelodeon, the Nicktoons, everything with that show, so please stay tuned for that. I have a few dates in the future in mind, but I'm not locking anything down as of yet, but the second I do, I will let you know. It's a big deal because this week in Nickelodeon history started out right here on this podcast, I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast, back when we were covering season two of SpongeBob, I believe just Post-pandemic, I I needed something extra to talk about. Wanted to bring in Nickelodeon anniversaries into this one podcast. And, of course, there were weeks where I was talking more about those anniversaries than our main man, SpongeBob. So that's not going to happen here. But I just wanted to mention the Season 2 finale. So stay tuned for that. T-O-O-N-E-D. This week's episode of SpongeBob SquarePants is Wig Struck. The second half of the 74th episode of SpongeBob SquarePants first premiered on November 17th, 2006, but it had a premiere a few weeks earlier on DVD on October 31st, 2006, as it was a part of the Whale of a Birthday DVD that was released on Halloween of that year, 17 days before its premiere. So those of you who had that DVD, you had a little bit of history there before anyone else did. Wigstruck was storyboard directed by Luke Brookshire, Tom King, who wrote this episode alongside Danny McCauley. Our animation director is Alan Smart, our technical director is Vincent Waller, and our supervising producer is Paul Tibbet. Another one. One other name I'd like to mention of the production part of SpongeBob SquarePants is the music editor Nicholas Carr who, beyond being the editor, is also one of the composers of some of the music of this episode. And the rock music that he brings to Ned and the Needlefish, any of the music that you hear behind any of their scenes, was done by Nicholas Carr. And off of the bat, the second that this episode opens, it has the right note, no pun intended. Uh, Ned and the Needlefish is a new band that we are introduced to in this episode. And... From the musical aspect, even though we have no idea how they play, we have never heard of a Ned and the Needlefish song, the music that is given to them from Nicholas is wonderful. It's just a point in this episode I had to mention. I don't usually get to mention some of the musical aspects. There are so many bits of music that are thrown at you, and down the road, I plan on having a extra special side episode just on the music of Spongebob Squarepants, but for now, Nicholas and what he brought to Wigstruck certainly struck a chord with the captain. Before we dive into today's episode, I'd like to take a moment to talk about wigs, or periwigs as they were originally known as. 
Their earliest appearance in the English language is the comedy The Two Gentlemen of Verona, written by William Shakespeare at some point in between the time of 1589 and 1593. But even beyond those times, wigs have made various appearances throughout history in many mediums and have a wide variety of uses. You may know of someone who wears a wig for whatever their reason may be, or you yourself may own a wig for, again, what, whatever reason that may be. But either way, I'd like to mention that the humor associated with SpongeBob's wig in this episode really comes down to the fact of the style of wig he's choosing more than the idea of wearing a wig in general. I feel like that line has to be mentioned. Because the term wig is so generic, it's so general, it encompasses a wide variety of hair pieces, and it's unfair to clump what you could purchase at a party city or a spirit Halloween for Halloween time versus a professionally made wig for people. So I'd like that line to at least be mentioned here because when you're bringing up the idea of goofy wigs or you're saying things like that or the idea of walking out of your house in a wig and then society laughing and pointing at you, that is not and should not be associated with people out there wearing professional style wigs for whatever reasons they may have. But if you walk out of your house in a, in a spirit Halloween level wig, or in this case, this regal style judge wig, which apparently is still being worn by people out there in the world. Didn't know if you knew that, but judges out there still dressing in the in the goofy, cartoonish way, because it's it's classic. You have to you have to go by the the standards of yesteryear. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, there are those out there wearing just goofy wigs. If you walk outside of your house in a in a clown wig you bought at Spirit Halloween, I'm not saying that you deserve or should have people point at you and say rude things. But you're going to have to know that people are thinking of those things internally or everybody is just Statler and Waldorf of the Muppets and having conversations with the person next to them about whatever is happening in front of them. Now, if you want to walk around in an unconventional wig and that is your definition of cool, I'm all for it. I will tell anybody to go by the beat of their own drum unless they're hurting somebody else. But you at least have to be self-aware to a certain extent, you know? If you're going to wear a professional-level wig or something that at least is is putting in the attempt of hair, you shouldn't have to have the fear of walking out of your house and anybody pointing or thinking anything. That is not any sort of association... And I don't think most people can see somebody in a, in a wig that is made that you can't just walk into a Halloween store and purchase. I don't think most people look at that and, and have those same thoughts. But if you are going to walk around public in a SpongeBob level clown wig, like back in the uh, No Weenies Allowed episode, if you're going to walk around proudly with that, I'm going to support you, but also... Mention that is a goofy wig. But you have my thumbs up. It's it's that level of support that Scooter gave in a previous episode. I don't remember if it was Scooter. Rock on, freaky dude. SpongeBob, tentacle pants. The, the episode with SpongeBob and Squidward combining with one another. We just covered it. That That is essentially me. Go by the beat of your own drum. Mentioning that something is freaky looking, it, it's all perspective. Something could be taken negatively, something could be taken positively. I, I hope somewhere I can explain that distinction here. I hope I've made some semblance of sense. That's all I want to mention, is that there are goofy wigs out there, but I don't want to make anybody who actually wears a non-goofy wig to feel like they're in the same boat. That was the spectrum I was mentioning. There are so many kinds of wigs, so many reasons to wear wigs. And in the beginning of this episode, we find out of one of those reasons from Ned of Ned and the Needlefish. We don't start out with SpongeBob, Patrick, Squidward, the Krusty Krab. 
we are starting out in the touring van of Ned and the Needlefish. Now, the Needlefish are hanging out in the front of the bus as Ned exits the back with his new wig. It seems like Ned has been having a bit of a hair loss issue and is trying to cover it up. Hair loss is one of those reasons that would make somebody want to get a hairpiece, a toupee, a wig. And no level of professionalism on that, trying to cover up your hair, should you be pointed at, made fun of. And I'm not even saying if you decided to wear the clown wig, should somebody point at you. Unless that is what the effect you're trying to go for, you know. If you're trying to be a clown, then okay, people should point and laugh. But if you're trying to cover up your your bald spot and you walk into a Halloween store and you go, you know what, that that really bad looking twelve ninety nine Sephiroth long gray hair wig is going to be perfect, and you're a fifty year old man, you know, maybe not the best idea. Should people point and laugh at you when you walk outside of that store? Absolutely not. But just know, when people see you, they're probably going, man, Sephiroth let himself go a little bit, you know? Something along those lines. I have no idea. But the, the point there being, that is a legitimate reason somebody could desire a wig. And I understand not everybody has the ability to get a professional level wig, but there are levels of goofiness within that Halloween section of the store. Getting the Sephiroth or... Getting a Master Chief, actually, to cover up a bald spot, a Master Chief helmet would be great. I don't know why I'm only thinking of video game characters right now. Uh, what other wigs? Oh, if you got a Pennywise from It style hairpiece, and like, this is going to be me from now on. Hey, if you want to own it, you have to own it. Even if you know it's a goofy look, you have to stick with that. Not let anybody deter you, and eventually things may come your way, and even if they don't, who cares? Who cares? No matter what I say, honestly, as a podcaster, any of my own personal opinions, I just want you to know that my like ultimate opinion of, of most things is not a who cares. I do care a lot about stuff, but when it comes to what you like in this world, what you enjoy, as long as you're not hurting anybody, go for it. Who cares? Ned comes out of the back of the bus with this regal-style stacked judge-looking wig that he is stoked about, he is proud of, and the needlefish immediately make fun of him. Which, look, I gotta say, being in a group of friends, if my friend came out of the bathroom with a wig like that and he was serious about wearing it, I would throw a few barbs at him. I'm not gonna lie, that's what friends do. I'm not going to say that to a stranger. I may think things, but I'm not going to say anything like that to somebody who is openly rocking a wig like that. But within a friend group, it's all open game. But it's all it's all within this level of love at the same time. Anytime I have ever made fun of my friends, it's to me my way of showing my sincerest love other than the fact that I also show my love through gifts and also just generally tell these people how they make me feel. But there is also this level of camaraderie that happens when you're in a close group of friends and you can clown on one another like that. And it's not done to hurt each other's feelings. It's to make each other laugh. There's a level. There's a certain line there. If you unfortunately don't know what I'm talking about, it is a certain level of a friendship you would have to find with somebody. You just you can't just make friends with somebody and then the next day start making jokes about them. That's not how you build a friendship. You have to have a long-lasting friendship or one that just reaches on a certain connection level very early on that you know, I'm not going to offend this person. Now, Ned and the Needlefish, clearly the fact that they're a band, they have some sort of camaraderie going on with them, so... Making fun of your bandmate for something they're wearing, probably not out of the, the realm of possibility of things that have happened. What is uncool in this situation, not really the hot potato of the wig, but the fact that because of that, it got tossed out the window. That's really not cool. 
I wish the band would have done something a little bit differently with their friend, but then we wouldn't have had a SpongeBob episode. As the wig leaves the uh, band's tour bus, it makes its way through some pretty crummy pieces of Bikini Bottom, including the dump where it whisks its way in. A dump truck then takes the wig out through the air. It makes its way through a graveyard, and for some reason, Bikini Bottom also has a wig cemetery, which this wig narrowly avoided. One of my favorite little visual gags of this season thus far, as it makes its way, of course, into the hands of SpongeBob SquarePants, who once sees this wig on top of his head, is immediately in love with the idea and look of this wig. It may be something where you need to have an overbite to have an appreciation for this style of wig because it seems like the only two people in this entire episode who enjoys this wig up until the ending are SpongeBob and Ned, who himself has a nice big overbite there. Even when SpongeBob heads over to Patrick, who pounces SpongeBob thinking he has some sort of brain-eating alien on top of his head or some wearable cotton candy, he, once finding out it's a wig, starts laughing at Spongebob. Patrick, of all characters, once hearing that this cotton candy-looking hairpiece is a wig, just starts laughing. He's the only character out of this entire episode who you could connect this laughter to of Spongebob just having a wig and it's not the style and that Patrick is a little bit more mean in this situation, which makes the ending with Patrick a little funnier for me for that, but I really don't like Patrick's whole demeanor in this whole situation. It's not funny looking when it's an alien or when it's cotton candy, but once it's a wig, haha, ha, uh, that's, that's not really that funny. But it is Patrick, so what are you going to do? Immediately after this, he takes his daily condiment bath, which I have to say, out of any of the antics of Patrick Starr up to this point, may have been one of the silliest, wackiest things that Patrick has done, his condiment soak of mustard. It really felt, and I'll, I'll say this for as negative as I sounded there, what I was really positive about was that Patrick having this alarm for this condiment soak really reminded me of a bit from Ren and Stimpy in one of my favorite episodes when Sven Hoek comes to visit. And right at the beginning of that episode, to establish just how dumb Stimpy is, they have this bit where his watch goes off and it's time for his appointment. And he goes over to this random door in their house, which opens up and he gets kicked in the head by a horse. That's his appointment. That is of the dumb levels of Patrick here, and for as negative as I am with the fact that it has to stoop to these levels of wacky, goofy Patrick, I also love that it's still in line with Nickelodeon, so it's just two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same jar of mustard. Um, as SpongeBob leaves Patrick's house, he is not met with any sort of praise or any sort of goodwill, although he is taking things in stride, and I do have to commend Spongebob for that. It's one of my favorite elements of this character. As he is heading to work, every single character on the streets of Bikini Bottom has something to say about his wig. And it's not good. It's in jest. They're laughing at him, not with him. But Spongebob is just soaking in the fact that everybody is finding enjoyment with his wig. And that is the perspective change that I I think most people could have, you know? We could walk through in that situation as SpongeBob, wanting to wear our wig, hearing these bits of pointing and laughing, and just get angry and lash out, which, you know, isn't going to really make the situation better. So it's all about the energy you output and how you handle situations that defines your character more than anything else. So taking the idea, the perspective of, well, I could be angry and upset that people are pointing and laughing, or I can just have 
the sense that people were distracted for a moment of life and had enjoyment on their face, even at my expense, which is the idea of so many different parts of entertainment. Professional wrestling, putting your body at risk. Stand-up comedy, where if you're self-deprecating or talking about yourself, you're opening up your wounds for everybody to see and pointing and laughing at it with everybody. Or where if you are a legitimate clown or you're doing something to hurt your own self, like the men and women of Jackass, you know? Putting your body at risk for the enjoyment of others. Destroying your reputation in the world of fashion for the enjoyment of others in terms of what Spongebob is doing here. He's accepting, though, all of this in stride. He's not necessarily understanding, though, that people are making fun of him. He is just seeing the enjoyment and running with that, getting to work, showing off the wig to Squidward, which, by the way, um, Squidward seems to be open at the idea of their conversation of getting a wig. SpongeBob mentions the idea of after work them going to get a wig for Squidward, and Squidward could have just said no. He said, I can't wait, but he didn't say no, which to me means that if SpongeBob was serious about going wig shopping after work, Squidward may have gone along with him. I mean, we know that Squidward has had wigs before, so it's not unheard of. He enjoys a good hairpiece, but he's not happy with SpongeBob's, as we later find out. The hair on this wig ends up becoming more of a problem within the Krusty Krab than the style of it itself. It hasn't become a distraction, but it is covering the Krabby Patties that come out of the Krusty Krab's kitchen in all of the white wig hair that come off of this thing. Now, it's a little annoying to have SpongeBob not just take the wig off at work. He brings up how much enjoyment it's bringing the customers and all of the other people out there to Mr. Krabs, but he's in the kitchen. Nobody's going to really see the wig. So just take it off while you're making the Krabby Patties and then put it back on when you're out of work. But... He's being stubborn in this situation, and we have seen SpongeBob be stubborn before, so it's not like this is out of character, but it is slightly annoying. Mr. Krabs, though, does make SpongeBob wear a hairnet to cover any of the possibilities of there being a hair on a future patty, and I gotta be honest with you, in all of my years of going to fast food, <laughs> very clearly... I have never once found a hair on my burger. Knock on wood, whatever counts as wood. I don't know if that's fake wood or not, but either way, um, I can't think of a time that I had a, a patty from a, a burger joint and a notable hair was on there. Never once. Now, I can't say that it has never happened before in my life in terms of food coming out from a restaurant. I have certainly have, unfortunately, have had a hair before in my food, but never at a burger place, never at a fast food place. I can only imagine somebody is listening to this right now going, oh, oh yeah, there was this one time at McDonald's or Burger King or, or Chick-fil-A, which I would feel like would be the least likely place to find a hair, but I imagine it's happened. I have to imagine. It's hair, you know? It's, you can only avoid it for so much, and it's disgusting of course if you were to find it in your food and hopefully if you do the place of of wherever you're eating at decides to take care of you and give you a new meal or at least give you your money back on top of that but uh yeah that's never a pleasant experience but I just can't think of a time from a fast food business where I've I've had hair in my food it's probably happened but for me personally and I'm not looking forward to it I don't expect it to ever happen. I, I don't want it to, but I can understand with the amount of hair that comes out on the Krabby Patty in this episode, good Lord, why would SpongeBob even look at that and go, yep, this is fine, but he's blinded. It's one of these episodes where SpongeBob gets so obsessed with one thing that it blinds him from common sense. Like I said, this isn't the first time that this has happened, but... This will not certainly be the last time, I'll tell you that much. As Mr. Krabs lets him know, if another patty comes out of that kitchen with hair on it, that hair is going in the dumpster. SpongeBob happily wears the hairnet, 
And as he exits the kitchen, maybe I was wrong on the idea of nobody being able to see it, but still, it does bring a fair level of enjoyment to Sandy, who comes over to SpongeBob to mention that they have some sort of uh, karate practice to happen at some point, but the laughter that Sandy gets from the sight of this wig on SpongeBob sends her in a complete laughing fit, not even able to bring up whatever she wanted to. I don't think we have seen Sandy laugh this hard since Texas, where she had to flush out all of the tears from laughter outside of her helmet. Clearly, the sight of this wig is even making Sandy laugh, which is pretty incredible. Even with all of the extra people making fun of SpongeBob in this situation, he ends up leaving the floor of the Krusty Krab thinking that, okay, they have turned from enjoying this wig to being jealous of this wig. I have to get out of here. And if you remember the As Seen on TV episode, SpongeBob does not read the room very well, you know? Everybody is making fun of him, and he takes it as enjoyment. But then, oh wait, he's taking it in a negative way. Is he understanding that they're making fun of him? No, he's taking it that they're jealous of this wig and that they don't have wigs themselves, so he has to exit the room. SpongeBob literally cannot think the worst of people. Even in a situation where an entire room of customers is pointing and laughing and making fun of his wig choice, his negative outlook of the situation is not that they're bad people, it's that they're jealous. Well, why wouldn't you be jealous? This is a fantastic wig. It still doesn't paint them in a bad light. Such an optimistic little fella, huh? As we later on see, this mop... <laughs> this wig doubles as a mop, which, by the way, once you see it used as a mop, you can't unsee it in its possibilities. Mop, 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 all day long. Mop, 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 while I sing that song. Gonna wax that floor, gonna make it shine. Gonna take off the spray paint with turpentine. As Squidward points out, though, that wig is absolutely disgusting. Not only did SpongeBob just use it as a mop to clean the entire Krusty Krab, but it's riddled with parasites. And on top of that, it's not really a cool wig. SpongeBob thinks it's cool, and Squidward mentions that SpongeBob wouldn't know what cool is. And really, I mean, what what is cool? I know most of you are probably thinking to yourself, the last thing the guy with the SpongeBob podcast needs to talk about is what being cool is, but genuinely, I think I have an idea on what being cool is. It's not anything you can wear. It's not any amount of tattoos you can have on. It's not any sort of fashion. It's an attitude. It's something you can't teach. You can't teach that. If you've ever heard that, then you know that there's certain things, like being seven foot tall. You can't teach that. Being a certified G. You, you can't teach that, making a little reference to wrestling here, but genuinely, there are parts of being cool that you can't teach. It's something that inherently comes with the person. Am I that person? I don't know. Maybe to somebody. But everybody out there has an idea as to what is cool, and regardless on who you're thinking of in that moment, once you break it down at the end of the day, whoever you're thinking of probably goes to the beat of their own drum. They probably do not let society tell them what to wear, how to think, what to do. They just exist. And then you look at them and you go, that person's cool. Whoever you're thinking of, it could be a fictional character, it could be a real person in real life, but there's something about that person that you can't teach. You can't hold a seminar and all of a sudden everybody who listened to that is now cool. That doesn't happen. You can't just become cool. You just are cool. Hey. The next day, Sandy arrives at the pineapple to discuss with SpongeBob whatever she was trying to earlier at the Krusty Krab or the day before, but couldn't because of the sight of his wig. Once she arrives at the pineapple, it seems like SpongeBob has installed a new door to aid in his wig so that it wouldn't have to 
rub up against his original door. And it's at the sight of this new door that I think Sandy realizes the scope of the situation that we're in. SpongeBob has a new obsession. SpongeBob has the kind of personality that once he finds something new that he falls in love with, it encompasses his entire personality until it either dies out and he gives it up completely or it simmers down to just a smaller part of his personality, possibly like jellyfishing. I have to imagine that the first few months of SpongeBob discovering jellyfishing must have been a nightmare for everybody else around him. But right now it's this wig. And Sandy, seeing this new door installed, realizes, whoa, we are really far beyond with this wig. I need to have a talk with SpongeBob. Now, I wouldn't say that going to a movie is the best place for a conversation, but they do have a conversation on their way to the movie theater about this wig, and SpongeBob is not deterred by whatever Sandy has to say. Even as they are walking through the movie theater, everybody is pointing and laughing, and SpongeBob is just bringing up how everybody is enjoying his wig. And that is fair. It's a fair place to be. What is not fair, though, is the guy who ends up tripping SpongeBob. I have to find out which incidental this was, actually, because this really buttered my biscuit. Let me tell you, I forgot that this happened. I knew that he fell in the movie theater. I remember the sludge being a, a problem when he tried getting back up, which it wasn't soda. I mean, it might have been just sticky soda. The floors of movie theaters are the absolute worst. Bar none, they're the worst floors. That and the bathroom floors of certain bars, those are the, the worst two. But the fact that a movie theater floor is even in the same conversation as the floor in a bar's bathroom, that's a problem. But I'm going through the incidentals here. Either way, one of the patrons of the theater, it's not even that SpongeBob sat down and it's in their way. He's just walking to his seat, puts out his flipper, and trips the guy. I got up out of my seat a little bit out of frustration. Like, whoa, I forgot that happened. What a jerk. SpongeBob falls into something sticky. I think it's soda. Maybe it's melted caramel or something else. But he seems fine and is over the moon over the fact that the wig broke his fall and he didn't have to break his face on the floor. And as he sits up, hey, look, floor popcorn is now falling out of his wig. Here's a little bit of another positive. I like this little moment of SpongeBob's blindness into this obsession where not only did a patron next to him try to talk to him over his wig being in the way, but then Sandy trying to talk to SpongeBob gets SpongeBob to shush both of them because there is nothing ruder than talking during a movie. Being completely oblivious to the fact that his wig is covering the entire screen. I love this entire bit of the movie theater. Certainly whoever was writing this episode really knew exactly where to put SpongeBob in this conundrum of a situation. Now, there are many moments throughout this episode that you can point to that the citizens of Bikini Bottom are the worst kind of allegory to how people up here on dry land act at the worst points in their lives. Kind of like real jerks. But even in the moment of this movie theater, the second that the word riot was brought up, they decided, you know what? Good idea. It's time for a riot. Certainly outweighing the negativity that blocking a movie can have with a giant wig. That's certainly not a good thing, but to then decide to grab your torches and pitchforks, that is a, uh, a completely new blowing things out of proportion kind of situation for the citizens of Bikini Bottom. What is wrong with you people? Huh? After this moment, it's SpongeBob's realization that this wig is now a detriment to himself and everybody around him, and he just has to let it go. Sandy convinces him to go to the top of a peak and to just let the wig go off into the rest of the world so that it can find a new owner. Now, earlier in the episode, we do get to take another look into Ned and the Needlefish and how things are going with the wigless Ned. Now at Big Shot Records, it seems like the owner of Big Shot Records is not happy about their current look. 
they are not in the business for hiring any bald musicians. And I have to say, there are a ton of bald rockers out there that would take exception to this kind of treatment. I'm thinking of Kenny King, Paul Schaefer, Billy Corgan, Scott Ian. You're not going to tell these guys that they can't rock for you just because they don't have hair on their head. Doesn't get in the way of their abilities. Billy Joel is bald. Phil Collins is bald. Leave these people alone. They can they can still rock out even with that hair, but it seems like whoever is running Big Shot Records is not having this, this bald net in the needlefish. And this is where the needlefish really grind my gears because it is their fault. Their fault that Ned doesn't have his wig right now. It's not their fault that Ned is bald, but the fact that here they are in this meeting where they may lose their contract as a band over Ned and his missing hairpiece, and it's their own fault that it's gone, and then they have the audacity to get angry at Ned whereas the anger should be reversed. You guys messed this up. And now we are at the end of this episode where Ned walking through the streets of Bikini Bottom, the dirty streets of Bikini Bottom, not really happy about that. Somebody should get on the uh, on the street sweeper there and clean some things up. But Ned is beside himself walking the streets, just wondering where he's going to find a new hairpiece, a new, a new wig. I'm a little confused as to where Ned got this wig in the first place. This fairly judgy, goofy wig. I have no idea where he came across it, but it seems like he can't go back to that place of origin. But luckily, SpongeBob let that wig go, and it made its way back to Ned. Ned is complete again. And come the next day in Bikini Bottom, as SpongeBob is making his way to work, he notices that everybody around him is mysteriously wearing the exact same wig that they were making fun of him for, even Patrick, who is wearing the wig under his arm. Instead of having arm hair, he has a wig. Now, what I really love about this entire sequence is that SpongeBob actually walks up and calls out one of these fish for pointing and laughing at him the other day over that exact same wig. Hey, You were just making fun of me over that thing. And you know what? The fish owns up to it. Yeah, I made fun of you because this was goofy until that happened. And he points up to a billboard that shows off Ned and the Needlefish sporting all members of the band sporting the exact same wig. So it seems like the Needlefish ended up with pie on their face. I hope that they're happy over their choice of hairstyle now. It seemingly with the fact that it's the coolest hairpiece you could have, I guess they might be okay with it, but I like how it ended up coming back onto them tenfold instead of just Ned wearing the wig. Now they all have to wear one, but because of this, everybody in Bikini Bottom is now sporting that exact same wig. And when SpongeBob has the realization that he was cool before cool was a thing when it comes to this wig, He is validated by this fish as well. You were. You were cool before this was cool. But you're not anymore. And that's the sad part about trying to chase what is cool. You're either starting the next cool thing or you're two steps behind. You can certainly follow the group and follow whatever you feel like is cool. Or you can just do whatever you want. And if other people decide to follow you and what they deem is cool, all right, that's fine. There have been artists out there who have found when their music is loved by others that they think that's uncool. Or if they make something ironic and it's caught on, I don't know. At the end of the day, who really cares what is cool, what is not cool? There is a certain general air to what is, but it's all an internal feeling. As I mentioned, if you walk out of your house with a a really goofy style wig, there may be people who will openly point and laugh, but there will just be a lot of us who are internal about that. And even when something is cool, we're internal about that as well. We think it more than we actually say it. There are those of us out there who obviously do a lot more of the saying, and, and they should probably keep their opinions to themselves, but 
you know, at the end of the day, at the end of it all, it's not going to matter what goofy wig you wore outside of your house on this one day and you made other people around you laugh. It's never going to matter about what you wore. It's always going to be about what you do as a person. Remember that. Remember that. You should never care about what other people think about what you're wearing, but just make sure that what you're doing in this world, the energy you're putting out there, is what people are noticing. Because I have seen plenty of people dressed up as goofy as possible, but they go by the beat of their own drum and they just persevere what they enjoy and they become their own mountain. I honestly, when I think of somebody who, when you look at them, you go, wow, I wouldn't expect this person to be anything but a goofball. I think of the amazing interviewer Nardwar, the human serviette, One look at this man and you would think to yourself, you walk out of the house dressed like that? But then look at his line of work. Look at the character he has built for himself. Look at the care he puts into his interviews. The body of work that this man has left behind says a lot more about him than the clothing he decides to wear or the hat he puts on his head. And that goes the same out there for anybody who has to wear a wig or feels the need to wear a wig. Remember, it's not about what the wig looks like or how you wear it. It's about you. It's about what you're bringing to the table as a person. I think Herman Munster said it best. I'm not going to replay the quote here, but it's all about your character. It's not about how you look or how you dress. So even if you want to wear what I personally may feel would be incredibly goofy, remember, that's just one person's opinion. You do you. Go by the beat of your own drum, be more like Spongebob, and just say, I'm ready. Thank you for joining me alongside another episode of Spongebob Squarepants, and thank you for being a part of another episode of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. Reminder, this Sunday, March 19th, is the season finale of This Week in Nickelodeon History. If you have yet to find this podcast, please, if you could, on Spotify, Go give that a favorite or go find the video on YouTube when it drops. Give it a like and let me know what you think of that current podcast. And if you have any suggestions of what you would like to see in the future of any sort of Nickelodeon anniversary content, I can tell you that season three is going to focus more on the Nicktoons than any other previous season. So if you have any suggestions, I would love to hear them. You can send them at NickelodeonHistory at gmail. Dot com, Nickelodeon History at gmail.com. If you would like to write into I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast, you can do so at SpongePodPodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to follow the captain on certain forms of social media, you can find me on Twitter at I'm Ready Podcast and on Instagram at SpongeBob Podcast. All of those links are in the podcast description below alongside the two ways you can support the captain if you feel like you would like to. The first of which is the best way by simply subscribing to the Captain Eric YouTube channel. You don't have to hit that bell if you don't want to be notified every single time there's a podcast, but beyond the podcasts, I also have exclusive video unboxings and content that are uploaded nowhere else but YouTube. Other than that, you can click on that red bubble link in the podcast description where you can find a bunch of different Captain Eric pieces of art logos that you can put on a bunch of different products, stickers, hats, t-shirts, anything of your choosing, anything that comes in from my projects, go directly back into my projects, and it's always appreciated. Members of the Ready Crew, I enjoy each and every one of you Thank you for coming aboard and making this podcast a real pleasure for me to do week in and week out. I have no plans on taking any breaks in terms of my SpongeBob viewing. I know that most of you out there would understand if I ever did, but I'm enjoying this ship. I'm enjoying our cruise through the fourth season, and I'm looking forward to next week 
So as always, please stay safe, be kind to one another, and come aboard again to another episode of I'm Ready! A Sponge Pod Squarecast. I know my wig is glamorous and exciting, but there is no need to start a riot. That's a great idea. Let's start a riot. I told you that movie was terrible.